I'd like to first of all just remind you of our mission statement. It keeps changing, but it doesn't change much, so it is. The Harris Submarine Museum, America's Call of Fame, America's Cup Hall of Fame, is dedicated to preserving, exhibiting, and interpreting the accomplishments of the Harris Up Manufacturing Company and the America's Cup for the purpose of education and the inspiration of excellence. That's what we try to do here. These are the two gentlemen who made it all happen. Uh, on the right, John Brown Harrisoff, president of the company. And on the left, Nathaniel Green Harrisoff, my grandfather. And by the way, there was a big family, as I've already indicated, and they ran out of names. So they gave him the uh, name from the grandson of General Nathaniel Green, who was George Washington's number two. And the curious thing is that for most of his life, my grandfather spelled his name N-A-T-H-A-N-I-E-L until at age 80 or so, he visited the uh, graveyard of General Nathaniel Green and he found out the spelling was N-A-T-H-A-N-A-E-L. So he immediately started writing his checks and doing everything in business with that name, A-E-L, and we have a lot of trouble these days, my brother particularly is named for him, in educating people to spell their name correctly. One of the earliest boats in the history is one that is in the back of the room, under the bell, at that side of the room, named Sprite. This was a boat that the young boys, aged 17 and 11, built in uh, 1859, so that in 1860, they could uh, sail down to New York to visit the Great Eastern, which was a huge ocean liner, about the same tonnage as a modern Queen Mary II. And so they sailed down there in company with their father, and maybe a little of their character is uh, indicated by the fact that their father had a pilot with him, particularly to navigate Hellgate, which is the narrow part of the East River which in those days was much more treacherous than now because since 1860 it's been blasted and widened out. And the boys were instructed to follow. Well, they didn't, they wanted to race, so they beat their father and they went right through Hellgate, no problem, and he had to follow behind with the, with the official pilot. So maybe that shows their early competitiveness. And this is a, a very wonderful boat uh, named uh, uh, Riviera that uh, my grandfather built in uh, 1874 when he was 26 years old. He was visiting family in Nice, France, and he built this boat, and he and a brother sailed it on uh, the Mediterranean from Nice to uh, Marseille, and the boat went up the uh, Rhone River into the high point of the Rhone Rhine Canal, and from there sailed to Basel, Switzerland down the Rhine River and on a steamer over to uh, the Thames River and up there. And all the time, uh, Nat Harrisoff visited every shipyard he could find and every boatyard he could uh, study. And he brought to America a lot of very interesting innovations. We take for granted that when you build a boat, you use metal screws to fasten the planks to the frames. But previous to that time in America, they'd been using trunnels, which were just wood plugs, sometimes split. So Captain Nett saw the advent of uh, metal screws in Europe, and he brought that idea to America. And I'm sure he picked up a lot of other very interesting ideas from all those visits as a part of his education. It's important. Well then, uh, as I said, they built uh, naval torpedo boats, and this is a picture of the uh, Cushing, USS Cushing, seagoing torpedo boat number one alongside a um, tourist steamer. And um, this is an interesting uh, story here. They built a speculation yacht named Stiletto. And the Stiletto is the boat in the foreground here. And she was uh, uh, some uh, 70 feet long or so, very narrow and had a lot of power with a new steam engine. And they went down to New York, because in New York was this big passenger vessel named the Mary Powell. 
And there's a picture of her also on the back wall. And Mary Powell was owned by Jay Gould, who was a financial magnate of New York. And he also owned the newspapers. He owned the early Herald Tribune. And um, these Harrisoft boys uh, decided they'd like to race her. So they lay in wait for the Mary Powell, and uh, they couldn't quite keep up with her until Captain Nat probably had to screw down a little bit on the safety valve of the steam boiler. And they passed the Mary Powell, crossed its bow, slowed up, went back around the stern, <laughs> and they went up from Manhattan to Albany and got there 10 minutes ahead of the Mary Powell. Jay Gould was furious. The Harrisos were then not well known, and he railed against them in his newspaper that these impertinent people from Rhode Island came down and shamed him by beating his supposedly fastest steamboat in the world. Well, that went on for a while, and then all the New York yachtsmen came to Bristol to get a fast uh, steamboat. So it's what we in politics call free advertising, much better than paid advertising. This is the, uh, the Cushing that I mentioned. Um, I don't think the date is right, but anyway, she was uh, seagoing torpedo boat number one. And you see the hull of steel is a sort of a uh, warship type deck. And she had uh, two steam engines, two boilers, and was a very able craft, which I think it's fair to say were really the forerunners of the type of vessel that even to this day is a, is a naval destroyer. They call these torpedo boats, so they sometimes call them uh, torpedo boat destroyers, and later the larger ones were called destroyers. But I had a very interesting uh, time this last weekend. We had a Navy captain who's commanded a destroyer, uh, Tom Williams, and we discussed this, and he agreed that these early Harrisoff vessels for the Navy were very, very instrumental in the subsequent designs that went on after 1900. This was Captain Nat's own uh, steam yacht, Roma, 96 feet long, had a lot of accommodations. All his sons were in the uh, uh, forward area of it. I guess this is going ahead a little bit on me. I'll back up. And uh, a lot of cabins above. And there were a lot of relatives in the family, cousins and all, and they made cruises every summer to Maine and probably had a great time with that. So this is the way things came to look here after a long while of uh, gradual development. Um, Captain Nat's house is here. It's called the Low Rocks. We don't own that anymore, but it's very much appreciated. He did his designing in the third floor in what he named his model room because his method of design was to make a model, a half model, to describe the shape. And here you can see the extensive shops. This was the south shop where most of the company vendors were built. A similar size shop here. These vessels were so big and heavy, they had to be laid out on the launching ways because they didn't have any very good way to move them. The, uh, the keel of the Reliance, for example, was 100 tons. It took 24 hours to uh, pour the molten lead into the form, and it took a week for the lead to cool before they could continue with the rest of the job. Up here was a wonderful shop, the East Shop, which we all lament its passing, but that's that open field there. There was nothing where we are except trees, but all the rest of these buildings were part of the Harrisoft Company. And this is a diagram made to show that, and um, if you want, I can give you a copy of this, and it shows what each of the shops were. Of course, the big construction was here. This was a smaller boat shop. This was the East Shop for medium-sized boats. This was the new storeroom, which is the building I have now for our current designing and uh, shop work. And we have this building, which was an early one. And over here was the upholstery and the electric and machine shops and boiler works and all that. So it was a very well-organized place. And one of the reasons they could build boats so quick was that a lot of the elements of the boats were produced in uh, subsidiary shops. So for example, if they had a brand new boat with a new design and new construction, while they were building the uh, 
keel framing and hull. The interior elements were largely built in uh, other shops and by standard methods and they went in. So that they could not only build these boats with high quality but uh, remarkably quickly. And this of course is the way thing looks uh, more nearly today. We have a better tent, but we have that pier. And uh, Daya mentioned the good news about how uh, some good money was raised. Well, we've been very fortunate over the years. One time in November, about 20 years ago, I was here and I was asked to go out to the street to meet a visitor. Well, a gentleman drove up in a Rolls Royce and he was a very forward and direct uh, gentleman, Don McGraw from McGraw Hill. And without saying much of anything, he said, if I build you a pier here, can I tie my boat up to it? Well, I said, I'll have to think about that. And I said, I have thought about it. And the answer is yes. <laughs> so that's how we got our pier. And Don McGraw had his boat here for a number of years. We did a good thing. We persuaded him to put the boat on the, um, what am I doing here? Uh, we persuaded him to put his boat on the outside like this boat is because it made a great breakwater and didn't use up any of the pier that we wanted to use. So. <laughs> but he didn't mind and he was very nice about it. This is uh, one of the products of the company, the great um, schooner Westwood, which was under the command of Captain Charlie Barr in 1910. And we love this picture taken in the Solent. Uh, I think there are nine sails there and she's winning a race coming down the Solent toward uh, cows. It's a great picture. Well, now I want to tell you a story that gives a little the character of some of our family. My grandfather's oldest brother was James Harrisop, born around 18, uh, late 1830s. And he was a very innovative fellow. And of course, at that time, when he was a teenager, maybe 1852 or something, there were no automobiles and there were no motorcycles. But he thought, that he would try a, an experiment. So he built an air engine. An air engine is rather like a steam engine in that there's a boiler which heats up the air and then the air, not steam, drives a reciprocating engine that can drive a machinery. So he had a bicycle and he applied this uh, air engine to the bicycle. But it was comprised of um, uh, as I mentioned, both a boiler and an engine. And by the way, uh, there weren't any such vehicles, so they had not yet invented brakes. And uh, they didn't have steering wheels for the bicycles. So he, he ran this thing, it was kind of noisy in the early hours of the day, so not to um, too badly upset the horses that might take off from the noise. So one morning he got up early to do this in the winter, and it was very cold, so he was afraid the boiler would not produce enough hot air. So he wrapped uh, newspapers around the boiler. And the boiler, by the way, was under his seat. So here he was on this contraption <laughs> with the seat and under it, newspapers insulating the boiler and no brakes. And he started down the street. And unfortunately, the newspapers caught fire. But being a very quick-witted and decisive fellow, since he couldn't stop, he turned off the street onto the original pier and ran off the end into the water and saved his life. <laughs> so that's the kind of guys that they were, and they were always doing unusual tricks of that sort of thing. <laughs> 